Um, I'm really happy to be joined again today by um, Marwa Osman, an outstanding journalist, analyst, academic mother, <laughs> um, so who is uh, going to be talking to me today about the recent events uh, in Lebanon that are obviously impacting also on Syria. Um, Marwa, welcome. Thank you, my dear. Thank you for having me. Um, I'd like to start with uh, the, the terrible uh, Tayune, if I pronounce that correctly, uh, massacre and ambush that happened a few weeks ago. If you can just kind of talk us through exactly what happened. Sure. Uh, on October 14th, um, 2021, that's uh, a little over uh, three weeks ago, we had um, a terrorist attack actually that happened against uh, unarmed civilian protesters who were trying to uh, take part in a demonstration against um, one of the judges uh, who's, uh, who actually manages the case or uh, works with the case of the Beirut port explosion. Uh, so there was a lot of politicizing of the case of the Beirut port explosion by uh, this uh, judge. His name is uh, Tariq Bitar. And uh, Tariq was not um, summoning everyone responsible. He was summoning only the people who are close to Hezbollah with this obvious aim to attack Hezbollah, obviously, despite the fact that Hezbollah has nothing to do with it. They, Hezbollah doesn't even have employees inside of the port, but he was just aiming at the friends of the resistance in Lebanon while uh, forgetting about the um, commanders of the army, both commanders of the army who were in charge at that time and who knew about it. He forgot about the three judges that uh, one that allowed the shipment to go in, another one that extended uh, the uh, stay of the uh, ammonium nitrate in the port, and one who actually just kept the file in his drawer because of certain things that we don't know about. He also forgot about the three prime ministers who were consecutively part of this uh, as well, or at least they knew about it, not only Hassan Diab, whom he summoned. And he also did not meet with neither presidents, despite the fact that the current president, Michel Aoun, uh, called him and asked him for a meeting several times, but the judge wouldn't go and see him to take his uh, statements. Uh, so people were... Um, a bit um, uneasy with the fact that it, this very important matter is being politicized. So they decided to go into a demonstration and this demonstration was backed by Hezbollah and by the Amal movement, the main uh, uh, ally of Hezbollah in Lebanon, which is the major uh, Shia group that is parallel to Hezbollah in Lebanon. So what happened is they called for it in front of the Le uh, Lebanese uh, justice palace in the area of, um, near the area of Tayune and Badaro in Beirut. And uh, Tayune, if you don't know, is a big area. It's a big roundabout. It's open space. It has the biggest uh, uh, green uh, open space in Beirut, which houses the uh, Hursh Beirut, which is the big green field of Beirut. Uh, so it's an absolute open area, which makes it easier for snipers to, hence, to target anyone on the streets of that area. So they went in the morning. Uh, what happened is the um, protesters who are affiliated with Hezbollah actually got to the uh, Palace of Justice, but it was the Amal movement um, protesters who were getting out of the area, which is en Rimene, and, and I want you to visualize with me the area, like a bird eye view of the area. It's a big chunk of Beirut, but it's actually the old uh, front line of the civil war. So it's Shia where majorly Shia residents reside and majorly Amal movement residents reside. And it's Ayn Rimene, where, where uh, Samir Jaja's Lebanese forces reside. And that area was a hot area in the civil war. And just and now it's no longer a hot area, obviously, but just one small highway separates both areas. So it's always uh, an area which sees a lot of intense uh, situations. What happened is the people of Amal who got out of Shia and went to the Tayune roundabout, to take that road that would get them to the Justice Palace. And while they were going there, uh, people started uh, falling, dropping, dropping. Dead bodies started dropping on the streets of Beirut because there were snipers on the buildings inside of Ayn al When that happened, obviously, there was a, a chaotic scene uh, in the area in Tayune, and people just started dropping. And then they, there was nowhere for them to hide because I told you it's an open area. Those who were able to leave the demonstration from the farthest part, which is closer to uh, uh, the um, airport road, 
they were able to go back and do, go into Shia and uh, later on after that we we heard the clashes what happened is that 9 30 a.m Hezbollah demonstrators got to the palace uh, 10 45 a.m ML movement protesters got shot at and sniped at and at Approximately at 12.15 or 12.20 maximum, because I had a, a, an online class that I had to stop because I had students in Tayuni area uh, who were docking because of bullets flying over their heads. So I had to end my class online. So I remember pretty well when the clashes started, because it started as a terrorist attack, as an ambush. People were sniped in, their, in the street. And then those who were able to retreat obviously got their weapons and uh, clashes began. That's exactly what happened in Tayuni. At the moment that this thing started to happen, you could go to the Twitter account of Jaja, Samir Jaja, the mm -hmm. head of the Lebanese forces, and you could start following what he was tweeting. And every tweet he was sending just implicates him even further in this act of terrorism against the Lebanese uh, unarmed civilians, because people who were unarmed were killed. Those who went and got their weapons and started shooting back were not killed. Just one of them were actually sniped, uh, which is a Hezbollah affiliate. But, uh, I mean, there were uh, seven uh, uh, martyrs. There were uh, six of them who were killed on the street. Uh, five of them who were killed on the street. One of them was sniped while holding an RPG. And uh, uh, the last one is a mother of five who was killed inside of her own kitchen inside of her own house, which oh. tells you, and that's a woman who wears abaya, the black abaya, which means she wears the most mm. religious, modest uh, clothing of uh, Islam, which means that the sniper was actually targeting her because the woman was wearing her hijab inside her house because she was waiting for the bus of her children to come back because everything was chaotic. Uh, Vanessa, I, when I dropped my class, I took my car and went like crazy to get my kids, and it was horrific. It was absolutely horrific. It was raining bullets on us. She was anxiously waiting for the bus for her kids to come back home. And she just died right there and then. Because one unbelievably racist, Islamophobic, inhumane uh, uh, being sniped her inside of her house because she's a Muslim hijabi woman wearing what represents the most, uh, uh, what most crowds uh, who are affiliated with Hezbollah or support Hezbollah wear. So there you go. That's exactly what happened. But Later on, what, what started happening is that uh, we discovered that two of these uh, seven uh, martyrs were actually uh, shot uh, from less than five meters away by uh, members of the Lebanese army. So you have now two sides implicated. Lebanese army, I think you saw that video that I'm talking about where the Lebanese army shot at two of the protesters. And these two protesters were Hezbollah affiliated protesters because they were far away from the sniping area. They were trying to get back there and they were talking with the army. They were saying that we need to get those people out of there because they were, they're gonna be killed. But one rogue member of the Lebanese army because I refuse to say that the Lebanese army is rogue. It's one member who uh, was, was taken into custody and uh, the person who must have uh, 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 yani, the person who must be held responsible is the head of the army. We can talk about that later on, why mm. the head of the army is responsible for this. Wasn't but, uh, so, one of the soldiers also connected to the U.S. embassy? From uh, one of the, uh, no, uh, the one connected to the U.S. embassy was one of the snipers. And I ended up right, right. He's, in, he's still in custody. Was at so a he's time that uh, Victoria Newland was was. Um, Yes, at the same time, well, Victoria Nolan had, had all, all already, um, like, uh, her visit was scheduled two days prior to, mm. to the, the uh, attack, to the terrorist attack, and uh, at that moment, she was actually um, on the way to meet with the head of the army, with the, with the commander uh, uh, of the army. Uh, his name is, um, oh, and his name is um, Joseph Aoun. Mm. So before she got to him, we had a statement on Twitter, on the official Twitter page of the Lebanese army saying that at, at, at 10 45 a.m., uh, unarmed civilian protesters were going to their location to hold a protest in front of the uh, Palace of Justice of Lebanon, and they were sniped in mid road. After that, two hours later, after Victoria Nolan met along with the uh, US ambassador in Lebanon, Dorothy Shia, with the commander of the Lebanese army, Joseph Aoun, they changed their report and said it was clashes. <laughs> they dropped that tweet and said it was actually uh, armed, an armed clash in Beirut. 
So there you go. That was the first result of the Nolan visit to uh, the the uh, army commander. Well, uh, mind also, you, now if we, if sorry, if we if we read any news or see any photo of our commander of the army alone, we would ask, oh, where's Dorothy? Because she's there <laughs> literally every day. So yeah, that's a lot of things to talk about. But yeah. what is very interesting is what happened later on, Vanessa, because mm -hmm. uh, 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 everyone was asking, well, uh, how come Hezbollah did not have an idea that there will be people sitting there preparing an ambush and targeting unarmed civilians. We all asked that question. And I actually asked that to the uh, uh, Lebanese member of parliament, uh, Dr. Ibrahim Musawi, who was a guest on my show, and he's a uh, he's an MP for Hezbollah. And I asked him, how come Hezbollah has a great intel? Uh, uh, he has great intel. So how come you guys didn't know that this is going to happen and pull people out of the streets? And what he said is, is just infuriating because he said that they got uh, all reports coming from the Lebanese army and the Lebanese uh, security services saying that everything is clear. Uh, we have more uh, members of the Lebanese army than we will actually be having protesters, protecting those protesters. So that's, that's why uh, they never pulled out the people. But apparently after the incident, New reports uh, uh, got out uh, from the Lebanese uh, uh, Directorate of Intelligence that says that two days prior to October 14th, which was a Thursday, so two days before Thursday, there were uh, a number of men uh, in uh, unidentified uh, with, with either cars with no platers or very uh, uh, vague plate numbers that, that were making uh, rounds uh, in the area. And they also have reports that say that a day before the incident, men were brought in from Ma'rab, were brought in from Kisirwen, and were brought in from Zahle to Ayn al -Rimene to take part in this, which, which tells us that the people of Ayn al had nothing to do with it, which also tells us that, that the people who wanted to initiate, to ignite the streets, wanted to implicate and push it into a civil war or at least clashes when the people of Ayn Rumen had nothing to do with it. So that's very, very important. So it was people brought in from outside of Ayn Rumen, outside of Beirut to take part uh, in this uh, issue. So that these are the reports that, that were uh, brought up, which led to uh, arresting a lot of uh, people involved. And uh, according to their testimonies and their statements, Samir Jaja was summoned by the uh, military court uh, in Lebanon by Judge uh, Aqiqi, uh, Judge, I um, forgot his first name, Fadi, Fadi Aqiqi in, uh, in the uh, military court. He summoned Samir Jaja to take his statement, but Samir Jaja refused and blatantly said that if you, if you want me there, you better get Hassan Nasrallah first. I mean, of course, yeah. just to put this into context, of course, Samir Jaja, in, in my opinion, is, is a criminal anyway. I mean, he was involved in the massacre that people will remember of Sabra and Shatila in 1992. Yeah. Uh, he's a member of the, as you say, the Lebanon forces, but basically they are uh, Zionist Christians, the Falangists, who, yeah. uh, you know, have been instrumental both in the criminalization of the Syrian government through history, <laughs> um, the, the yeah. massacre of Palestinians, and now, of course, um, this campaign to 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 incite a civil war, which you know we have to say is at the behest of the the United States and Israel and the colonialist the neo-colonialist powers. The fact that Newland was there, and for people that don't know, of course, Newland was involved in the um, military coup in the Ukraine. Uh, and yeah. very similar tactics, you know, the snipers on the roofs. And, and this was a tactic that, that people saw in Syria also. Let's not forget this, you know, snipers on yeah. the roofs, killing civilians and blaming the, the Syrian security forces, who at that time were not even carrying weapons. Um, constitutionally, they were not allowed to carry weapons to protest. Mind you, we have we have reports for uh, Samir Jaja of him confessing. You'd find you could find it on YouTube, but it's in Arabic yeah. where he is confessing of a lot of the uh, uh, massacres that took place. I tweeted on uh, mm. on October uh, fifteen. I tweeted about the uh, most infamous massacres committed by Samir Jaja and the Lebanese forces. Where you could find it on, on my Twitter, where I have numbers and dates and names. Excellent. Last of which. Uh, was the uh, massacre of um, uh, the, uh, uh, the bombing of the Our Lady of Salvation Church in the Zouk area in 1994, which led him to 
to be uh, incarcerated and put uh, in prison for only 11 years, sadly, and then he had uh, a pardon. Pardon mm. from the Lebanese parliament, not from the, from the families of the people who he uh, killed. And mind you, Sabra and Shatila had more than 3,000 martyrs, mm. Palestinians and Lebanese. Uh, you have uh, also the, the massacre of Tal Zatar uh, in 1976, mm. uh, where a camp, uh, uh, the, 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 the first of all, they sieged the camp for two months and they killed 3,000 humans. That's different, uh, separate from the um, Sabra yeah. and Shatila, and you have the massacring of Tony Frangi and other massacres. You can find it on my uh, Twitter account as well. This is uh, a, a psychopathic, warmongering, uh, a, a fascist, Zionist Christian. That's uh -huh. that's how you describe it. Because that man, I mean, look, everyone, every warlord in Lebanon was a politician who turned into a warlord and then continued to become a politician after the Ta'af Accord. But yeah. Samir Jaja is a warlord who has been obliged to become a politician, but he doesn't know how to play that game. Just it's it's whatever you see Lebanese forces. There's blood wherever you go, wh whatever they speak. However, they, they, they their form of speech is always about power and force. And yeah. to be honest with you, they are nobodies. I'm not saying that uh, that um, I I condone any form of violence in Lebanon. No, I don't want any form of violence. But some people need certain force to stop them from committing massacres. And I'm talking about the Lebanese army. The Lebanese army should be should be held responsible and should stop these murderous machines that go roaming around Lebanon trying to ignite civil war. Yeah, and and you know who are clearly being weaponized by by the uh, Zionist regime and Saudi Arabia and, yeah. and the Zionist entity. Yeah, exactly. Um, so that was, you know, I just wanted to put that into into context to to understand fully um, the, the the power behind what happened in Tayune. And then if if um, if we go forward to Sayed Nasrallah's uh, speech, which I think came a few days on the Monday after the massacre, if yeah. I remember correctly, um, how yeah, did he? 19. Yeah, how did he address um, the massacre and and explain to us the difference between the reaction from the Hezbollah leadership and the likes of Samia Joja, who are clearly being um, pushed by their puppet masters, <laughs> um, as you, you know, said. Look, uh, sometimes it, it, what what happened is the the Lebanese. Uh, the Lebanese population who are supporters of the resistance in Lebanon have been, uh, since the beginning of, of uh, 2020, if I may, I'm not going to say, uh, let's say since the explosion up until now, uh, not to mention the provocations uh, and the controversy be behind and the controversy behind the October 19, 2019 um, uprising, October 17, excuse me. So not talking about that uprising in specific, which obviously turned into something against Hezbollah. I don't know how an anti-corruption protest would turn around to be against the resistance arms. But uh, starting after the port explosion, just hours after the, after the port explosion, despite the fact that it was 217 martyrs, more than half of them are uh, uh, Muslims, and the majority of them are Shias, who fell victims of this explosion, which is the result of corruption, and it might be also the result of terrorism, hence why we never saw the result of the FBI and the German intelligence uh, uh, results of the investigation. Mm. So uh, since they, like literally day zero, just hours after the explosion, uh, we started hearing um, uh, uh, people who are affiliated with Saudi Arabia, with the Zionist entity, with America, uh, putting their, uh, just, like, their points and, or, or pointing at Hezbollah, uh, to be behind it when in fact if you have ever been in beirut in that area in specific you know that hezbollah has no absolutely nothing to do with that area so uh, that's that's uh, a fact now uh, since then up until today the audience or the population that supports hezbollah has been put in uh, pressure several times you have the port you have what happened in uh, khalde the uh, the also the attack that happened in Khalde when one Hezbollah member was uh, killed in cold blood and then during his funeral there, his family members were killed by uh, Al Qaeda Al Qaeda affiliated people who are obviously supported by Saudi Arabia you have that and then uh, a couple of weeks after that you had uh, the member of the Lebanese resistance who actually retaliated against Israeli aggression and while he was while he finished his mission he was coming back 
to his base and he was stopped in a Durzi uh, area in South Lebanon and he was beaten up. That was the first time that has ever happened. And that was a dagger that went through our hearts. This was a man who was putting his life on the line to retaliate to an Israeli aggression. And you had the audacity, you ungrateful pigs to stop him and beat him up in, in this. And he didn't even defend himself. He was looking at the people. You could see the videos looking at the people saying, what are you doing? So you have these cases and then you have the Tayuni massacre. So people were fed up. People already had hatred growing inside of them. And it was up to Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah to come and try to bestow his wisdom against the people because we know that he's the most patient human to ever set foot in this country because if he were something similar at least similar or two percent of samir jaja he would have started a civil war in lebanon mm. but we all have heard him several times hezbollah never took part in the 1975 to 1992 civil war in lebanon hezbollah will never take part in an internal fighting in lebanon because hezbollah is way bigger than that and hezbollah works and hezbollah goes beyond the borders of lebanon to protect Lebanese security to protect us from the civil war. If it weren't for Hezbollah, I would have died along with my daughters because of Daesh, ISIS. They, they had more than 2,000 martyrs for Hezbollah from 2012 up until today because they were defending us from terrorism. And we had hundreds of thousands of of, uh, of uh, thousands of fighters and hundreds of thousands of civilians who fell due to the Israeli aggression. And thanks to those fighters, we got our land liberated and we got it back and got our dignity back and we eliminated the occupation from our lands. And you still have people who have zero dignity, who want a war, who wouldn't listen, who even if you tell them whatever they want to hear, they would still get it and turn it against you. Mm -hmm. So what Sayyid Hassan Nasrullah said during the speech was, was just obvious. He said, look, we need to pinpoint the problem and we when we pinpoint the problem we need to stop and to listen because the first half of the speech was all a speech towards the lebanese christian community in lebanon because he was telling them look there are certain people in lebanon and outside of lebanon telling you that to be afraid to have fear of hezbollah i tell you guys and he started listing what hezbollah did to secure Christian and Muslim communities, to bring about Muslim and Christian communities. And especially, he mentioned, especially the accord that was signed with the Lebanese um, uh, Free Patriotic Movement with uh, President uh, Michel Aoun before he became president, when he was, pres when he was the uh, chief of uh, the Free Patriotic Movement. Uh, has it not been for that agreement signed in 2005, we wouldn't have had that great backing for the resistance in Lebanon. So Hezbollah was working properly ever since the attack against Hezbollah began in 2005 after the assassination of Rafi al-Hariri. So it all brought, brought into towards today, Said Nasrallah spoke about this and told the Christian community to have faith in Hezbollah, to have faith in their ability and capability to not allow a civil war to take place in Lebanon. It was a very, for me, it was the most important speech that Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah ever did after the 2006, uh, after the victory of the 2006 war with the Zionist entity. I think it was that much important. Later on, he spoke with the public, with the population who supports Hezbollah and told them that he knows how painful it is for them to just pick up their pieces and move along, but they have to. But on the other hand, we never leave the blood of our martyrs on uh, our soil. We take uh, their rights via uh, uh, the, the legal uh, pathway. So we know that the Lebanese judicial system is a corrupt one, that not everyone uh, who works within the uh, Palace of Justice in Lebanon is to be trusted, but we also know that this would be the, mo the, the most important factor to secure uh, the national security of Lebanon and the internal uh, security of Lebanon by making it a more powerful justice system by putting the Lebanese army and the justice system up front and telling them, look, you need to take your responsibility, you need to do your duties, and we got your back just do it. And this is uh, exactly what happened. And uh, we're still waiting to see what happens next, uh, because uh, uh, I told you Sami Jaja wouldn't, uh, 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 you know, he wouldn't respond and he wouldn't answer to the court uh, uh, summoning to the subpoena. But Sayyid Nasrallah was, was very clear in not mentioning Samir Jaja's name. I mean, he said more than 
I think it was, I believe it was more than 80 times uh, the Lebanese forces. And whenever he wants to talk about it, he would say the head of the Lebanese forces, he wouldn't even give him the honor of mentioning his name. And that in Arab culture, that's a very, very important message because mm. Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah was not talking to him. He was talking to his masters. He was talking to the U.S. occupation in Lebanon and to the Saudi non-existence influence that they keep want to try and impose it on us in Lebanon. So that was the most important factor because Said Nasrallah was literally uh, threatening the Americans here. He was not even talking to those couple of rogue uh, Lebanese mercenaries. He was telling the Americans that if you want to play out the wrong way and if you want to ignite something that you will get a taste of it and he was talking yeah. to Saudi Arabia hence the complete hysteria that happened later on this week that we can talk about yeah absolutely and I believe that um fairly recently the Saudi ambassador who's um being recalled I believe and the Bahraini ambassador um but the Saudi ambassador was speaking to Jojo or had a meeting with Jojo fairly recently is that correct just before he left yes yeah yes yeah. just before Walid Bukhari the ambassador uh, before he left Lebanon he went and met no with no one except Samir Jaja so if that's not a red flag to say that this is the Saudi man inside of Lebanon because they completely got rid of Saad al-Hariri and they completely uh, uh, shut down any Sunni influence in Lebanon, giving Jaja the, the platform, which was the biggest mistake they could ever do. But what do you expect from a rogue mob that was installed by a colonizing entity to to take Hejaz and to rob it and to uh, basically play piracy uh, in the region of uh, uh, the Arabian Peninsula? So the, this is a rogue family that has never taken action that has actually been positive either for them or their puppets in any country. So what happened was uh, something very much expected, but he never expected it to happen over something so lame and ridiculous, like an old statement for an information minister. I mean, come on. Yeah, I mean, this was extraordinary. I mean, just to explain, I mean, I believe it was the information, the Qatari information minister uh, and the minister whose name I forget in Lebanon, who made a statement that the Saudi war uh, against His name is George, Yemen, George uh, Kordahi. Yeah, yeah, exactly. George he Kordahi. made that statement for the first time in 2017, right? So, I mean, this is... <laughs> uh, no, no. Our, our minister made that statement four months ago. So it was right. two months prior to him becoming a minister. So it's, right. it's, it's freedom. Saudi, Saudi Arabia has, has, uh, has allergies against uh, freedom of expression. <laughs> Um, and, and, you know, I mean, it's extraordinary because the statement itself to, to say the war against Yemen is, is useless, is lame also. I mean, it's, it's way more yes, than useless. Everybody has said it. I mean, I mean, if you, I mean, can they explain to me how a word, a statement that goes like, I believe that the war on Yemen is pointless, pointless and it needs to end, is any uh, uh, less in, uh, is, is any more insulting than a statement by Trump that says, um, I think Saudi Arabia is a cow and we need to milk that cow. Mm. How's that? I mean, how do they operate? I mean, did they ever listen to every time Trump makes a statement about them? He said, I called the king. I told him, king, you need to pay. I was like, I would have shot him in the face if I were a Saudi tribal mentality idiot. But I mean, they only act like that against people of their own and I'm I mean Arabs because they think that they have an influence uh, against them but but to be honest with you Vanessa it's the crisis is is not in Lebanon we don't have a crisis the crisis is in Saudi Arabia it's not our problem if they if they are uh, so much triggered by the truth mm. I mean well I think that they... bin Salman is is suffering an inferiority complex. This is his problem. If he has an inferiority problem uh, complex, he should solve it himself. Why? Why punish an entire nation? And every time anything happens with, between them and international diplomatics, between them and any other country, why do they always threaten people of that country that work in Saudi Arabia? They're working for their. They are labor. They are not there because uh, they're they're stealing their money. No, the Lebanese people are in Saudi Arabia working. They're working their butts off to make ends meet. So every time anything happens, they say we want to uh, uh, like uh, kick them out of the country. Kick them out already. Kick them out. Stop 
intimidating the public over something as ridiculous as freedom of speech. We saw what you did to Khashoggi, by the way, because the man had some, some, not a lot of courage, but some courage to, to just stand up in, in your, uh, the face of your foreign policy. I mean, this is just ridiculous. But look, um, the fact that Mohammed bin Salman co called his, his, his rogue buddies in the uh, Persian Gulf uh, Arab states to increase the pressure on Lebanon, it's just an attempt for him to try and kind of restore his reputation, which, by the way, has been buried under the Yemeni feet in Ma'rib. And that's exactly why this happened. The main reason, because everyone keeps asking, is it possible that this diplomatic row is because of statements said by a minister he was not even a minister? No. What happened is, what, what happened started with this hysteria was the result of the last meeting that happened between Saudi Arabia and the Islamic Republic of Iran inside of Iraq because it's mediating talks between them. And what happened is Saudis asked the Iranians to talk to Ansarullah in Yemen and make them stop their offensive against Ma'rib. What Iranians said is that we can't help you with that. If you want someone to mediate talks with Ansarullah, you should go talk to Hezbollah in Lebanon. And that made them so furious. Mohammed bin Salman just lost it. And he tried to find something, and the only thing that he could find was a lame student statement, a lame old statement by our new uh, information minister, uh, George Kordahi. And look, if, if George Kordahi had resigned, this would have been a message to every politician in Lebanon that he will never open his mouth against anything that Saudi Arabia does, or else he will lose his job. Like, they, they made us feel as if we are part of their kingdom. We are not part of anything that is related to them. If they have a couple of mouths, a couple of mercenaries and puppets in Lebanon who just sing their songs and have no morality, no dignity, who are happy to bow down and kneel to the feet of Muhammad bin Salman, we will never do that. We, eliminate, we eliminated every occupier and every terrorist entity that tried to take over our land. Do they think that we cannot stand up to them? Muhammad bin Salman is just paranoid and he needs to see a psychiatrist right away because he, if he, if he tries and, and uh, bring about the, the, the uh, GCC countries to start some sort of war or at least a war of sanctions on Lebanon, he really doesn't know who we are. He really have no idea. He has no idea who we are. He would have bombs falling on our heads while going to the pool. This is how we live. Yeah. And I think also, I mean, just again, for, for people to understand the context and the importance of the uh, liberation of the Marib area, of course, Marib is uh, one of the main oil resource, oil field areas in Yemen that was under the control of the Saudi proxies, of course, very similar to Al-Qaeda in, um, in Syria. Um, and uh, the Saudi plans, which were um, exposed by WikiLeaks a while back, were to build a pipeline to the southern coast of Yemen and to avoid then the, the Bab al-Mandeb Straits and the Hormuz Straits. Of course, Hormuz under the control of Iran, Bab al-Mandeb under the control of Yemen. So they wanted to bypass that, steal the resources and set up um, southern bases, which of course also is the project of uh, the US, the UK and their allies, including the UAE. And you talked about the kind of fall from grace of Saudi Arabia and how they are now trying to kind of shore up their reputation and, and to uh, retain their foothold as uh, the proxies uh, of the US coalition. And of course, they have competition also from the UAE, both in Yemen, um, but also in the relationship with Israel. You know, the UAE is building um, a very strong relationship um, both with Israel and with the British and American intelligence agencies. So that, you know, Saudi is, is kind of seeing its power base, which was really only built on its oil revenue. Um, and Yemen has very intelligently, and Srullah have been very intelligently targeting um, the, the Saudi oil revenue. They've been attacking the, the, the oil um, refineries both in Saudi Arabia and also the recapturing of, of Marib is a, is a massive blow to Saudi Arabia. And, and that's why this entire maelstrom has been generated, as you said. Um, and then and, the final And by the insult. way, Marib has, Marib has fallen. Uh, and and the, yeah. the importance, as you said, of Marib is that it is the first block of, uh, of breaking the, the siege mm. and the blockade because this would allow them to uh, get the oil that they were not allowed yeah. to get through the sea because of the blockade. So that would exactly. be a 
great blow to the main objective of Saudi Arabia, which is to suffocate the people of uh, Yemen, the brave people of Yemen. I've never seen such people, Vanessa, to be honest with you, who have that much of faith and uh, steadfastness in the face of a war machine that has been taking their lives since uh, March 15, 2015. Exactly. I mean, the level of courage these people have and uh, I mean, they're, they're suffocating. They don't have medicine. They don't have uh, food. Uh, they, they're every, I mean, two years ago, it was every 10 minutes a Yemeni child dies. Mm -hmm. Today, it's more like every three minutes a Yemeni child dies because of malnutrition and because of uh, diseases. And, and we're talking about preventable diseases, mm -hmm. but because they don't have any medication to treat their kids, the kids are dying. So it's an absolute genocide what's happening. And still you find that these people, they never give up. Because they have nothing else to lose. And Saudi Arabia doesn't get to understand that. They, they keep buying nurseries from Africa and from uh, Blackwater to fight their own fight. And they keep losing it. I mean, you should watch the videos where these nurseries are fleeing. And you have barefoot people following them, attacking them. Because these barefoot <laughs> yeah. people are the Yemenis, the native Yemenis. It's yeah. beyond anyone's imagination. And the level of... of um, silence, the spiral of silence in the mainstream media is deafening. I mean, they never talk about it. Exactly. Well, and also, you know, it's the fact that, um, again, a lot of people don't understand this because uh, the resistance is, is described always as Houthi rebels in quotation and marks. And it's not. It's, it's just an one entire of the movement. tribes. Yeah, exactly. Yes, it's, it's more than 10,000 tribes in Yemen. And they call them, they ignorantly call them Shia. If you go to yeah. Sanha <laughs> and call a person or Sada and call a person Shia, you will get... A very, a very, a very uh, uh, yani, suitable uh, reply, which would be a, a knock, a knockout. They would <laughs> knock you out. They, they, yeah. they are Zaydis, and they are proud of themselves for being Zaydis. And you have the mainstream media calling them Shia just to make them appear as if they are mercenaries of Iran. Exactly, and, and actually, it's a totally different version uh, of Shia Islam to the Iranian. Uh, Islam, if, if if I understood that correctly, I can't remember exactly the differentiation. Exactly, between exactly. Them, but... It's it's not it's not it's, it's not even Shia. To be a no. Shia, uh, to be a Shia, you have to be a twelver, a twelver yeah, Shia, exactly. which means you believe in twelve imams. They mm. don't, which is mm. why they're Sunni, which means they are a form of Sunni Islam, yeah. and that's something that Saudi Arabia is not ready to understand. I mean. <laughs> Prophet Muhammad was a Yemeni, for God's sake. They keep saying that he's a Saudi. He was never a Saudi. He's a Yemeni. He himself <laughs> called himself a Yemeni. We're talking about a people who go back in line to the Prophet himself. Mm. They will never give up. They will never stand still while their country is being bombed and looted. A graveyard of invaders. I mean, Egypt learned that exactly. at its great cost. <laughs> you know, and Saudi Arabia is certainly going to find that out. And of course, that's what it's desperately, as you said, trying to, to protect mm. By its image. By the way, I have image. breaking news... Uh, I have mm. breaking news for you concerning Samir Jaja. Just now, mm. uh, Samir Jaja uh, uh, had a statement on MTV. MTV is the uh, is his own channel, also mm. Uh, mm. funded by Saudi Arabia. It says that um, Jaja is ready to give his testimony in the Ayn Rimeni case, which mm. is the Tayuni massacre case, provided that Judge Sawan is asked to move to Ma'rab. He wants the judge to come to his own house to, to, to take his to take his statement. I mean, who did he who does he think he is? I mean, oh not even I mean the president it's on according to law, only the president of Lebanon is allowed to, to do that. Wow. Who do you think he is? He doesn't, he, he doesn't even have an official position in the Lebanese uh, government. I mean, this, so, is a, this is another indication that this guy thinks he has the, you know, it's very similar to the Kurdish separatists. They're, they're very bullish because they believe they have the backing of the US and Israel and so on. And so clearly this is what Jaja believes. He believes he can do anything. He believes that he's not answerable to, to Lebanese constitutional law. He believes he's above all of that because he believes they have his back. And, and this is the stupidity of these people that sell themselves out um, to these criminal, absolutely psychopathic regimes like the US regime, the UK regime, the Israeli, the Zionist regime. I won't give it the, mm -hmm. the, the respect of calling it Israel because it doesn't exist. Uh, and, you know, and, and so they believe that they are uh, absolutely protected and of course they're not they're only protected for as long as they're useful and these people are exactly. effectively too stupid um, to understand that their role 
uh, in the power play that is being led by the US and Israel and the UK is negligible. You know, they're dispensable. There'll always be an idiot that, that, that will take the money, will take the promises of power and, and status and so on over um, their own people, over human beings. And, and these people will always end up, I believe, and I hope in the same position as they've put uh, the people of their country. You know, it's like Jolani here in Syria and so on. You know, all these people that have prostituted themselves to the imperialist cabal, to the Zionist cabal, um, will hopefully end up in, in the same position. <laughs> well, I think if, if there's, there's um, a proverb in Lebanon that says, uh, if you haven't died, have you, haven't you seen who actually died? Which means if you haven't read history and you don't know what happened to all those who stood by the aggressor against their own countries, they were treated like uh, washed up husbands who have no further influence or role except treason in their country. If you haven't gotten a lesson, if you haven't read about it and, and understood it perfectly, you will never learn that they will always be a group of people, no matter if they are the majority or not, despite the fact that the majority in Lebanon is the pro-resistance majority. But even the fact if they were not, let's say that they were not the majority, they still will refuse to bow down to external influence. They cannot fathom the idea that there is something called an allied forces of resistance that has risen in the region from Beirut to Damascus, to Baghdad, to, to Tehran, down to uh, uh, Yemen, to Saada and Sana'a and Ma'rib and Hudaydah, up to Palestine, to uh, uh, Tunisia, to Morocco, to Algeria. They cannot understand that there is an alliance that could actually stand in the face of imperialism and colonialism, which they have always bowed down and treated as, as if they were gods, unbeatable gods. I mean, look at the, uh, these same people who now stand with the Zionist entity and with uh, uh, the external influence uh, and the intervention of external powers in Lebanon. They were the same people who stood with the Turkish occupation, with the French occupation. Those who were the same people who got all the influence after Sykes-Picot was, was signed and was put out and it broke out the, the Levant. And now when all these plans that were put in place hundreds of years ago, these people and while they see that these plans are being broken, they are being broken into shatters, we will not accept a sykes pico between Lebanon and, and uh, Syria and Palestine. And we are one land, one people. They cannot, they cannot divide us. This is what the entire war is about, to divide us even further. It's not going to happen. These same people who still stand with the outsiders, with the invaders, they cannot fathom the idea that there can actually be a healthy relationship, not a master subordinate relationship, but a healthy relationship between allies. Hence, hence the relationship between Syria, Iran, Hashd al-Shabi in Iraq, Hezbollah in Lebanon, Ansarullah in Yemen, uh, the uh, resistance in Palestine, whether in the 1948 or West Bank or Gaza Strip, they cannot fathom that idea. They are so used to being subordinates that they think that everyone else is. Mm. I, mean, I just, it's, it's, like, it's like talking to a rock. A rock can actually understand and they never were. Yeah, it's, uh, that, I mean, that brings me then um, onto the more recent speech from Nasrallah where he, um, I can't remember the exact timing. It came after the Israeli attack on Palmyra, um, which killed uh, Hezbollah and Iranian uh, soldiers who were obviously fighting um, ISIS, uh, who of course had been embedded in the desert area to the east of Palmyra and Homs uh, by the US occupying forces, who are basically percolating ISIS fighters from Syria to Iraq, back into Syria, and then to various strategic areas um, of that area east of the Euphrates and west of the Euphrates um, to attack uh, Syrian military and their allies, which include uh, Hezbollah and Iran. And you know, those are the legitimate allies. This is another important point to make because Israel's argument is that it's, it's preemptively, defensively attacking 
um, Hezbollah and Iranian points in uh, Syria, whereas in, the reality is under international law, they are the legitimate allies of Syria that is fighting a terrorist invasion of its country, which is being financed and armed and sponsored um, by countries in NATO member states, uh, Israel um, and the Gulf states and Turkey, of course, which is also a NATO member state. So Nasrallah's speech came um, as a very forceful warning uh, to both the Zionist entity and, of course, its allies in the US and particularly the UK, um, speaking about the military organization of Hezbollah and of, unusually the number of fighters that are uh, active, I believe, uh, in Hezbollah and those that are uh, if you like reservists, but who would join the battle were there to be uh, any escalation of the conflict. Can you talk a little bit about that situation? Yes, of course. But at first, I want to talk about the lame Israeli uh, excuse of them having preemptive uh, defensive uh, strikes, <laughs> yeah. and they say it's against Iranian or Hezbollah uh, posts in Syria. Uh, why is it always then when that happens, we have martyrs from the Syrian Arab army? Yeah. Funerals of martyrs from the Syrian Arab army. I mean, that, and by the way, actually going into debate with that is accepting the fact that Israel has a right for preemptive strikes. Exactly. It doesn't, it's an aggressor, no. it's an occupation, it's a, a colonial uh, uh, entity, a warmongering colonial entity that thinks that they think that they have right above everyone else in this uh, region, which they don't. They need to put into place, and I think they will be put in place into place soon. But something very, very important, and the issue of Tayyumi actually covered this important thing that happened on October um, 12th. Uh, it was either on Tuesday, October 12th, or Wednesday, October 13th. I, I don't want to be uh, wrong. I don't know how to pick a date. But what happened is something very, very important and a new development in Syria. Not only the usual uh, Israeli aggression that happens via Israeli uh, air force, uh, warplanes, jet planes, what happened is simultaneously with that airstrike, there was simultaneously surface to surface missiles sent from the Al Tanf base yeah, exactly. on the border between uh, Syria, Iraq, and Jordan to mm -hmm. that uh, area in Palmyra that was hit, which was an area for the allied forces of the resistance, mm -hmm. which then, and that, that's a major development because when you activate from inside the Syrian land, although it's an occupied land, when you activate aggression against Syria itself from within Syria itself, you are giving it all the green lights to bomb you the hell out of there. And what I mean is, the uh, proof of a 10th operation. What happened this next week after that, also in October, late October, was that a, a new cell unit, it's not really new, but we're getting new statements out of it, new official statements out of it. It's called uh, Azdiqa Surya, which is Syria's friends, meaning the allied forces of resistance of the region inside Syria, which are made of, uh, which are made up of Hezbollah, Iranian uh, troops, Iraqi Hashdi Shabi troops, Syrian national defense forces. There are Syrian nationals in that also uh, uh, alliance. And uh, as well as um, sometimes uh, uh, the Syrian Arab army, because at certain points they share the same bases. Yani they, they, at some point they, they, they are in the same base. But at other points, you know, it's, it's separate uh, checkpoints and separate bases. But that group, which is Syria's friends, which are the allied forces of the resistance, retaliated. And where did they retaliate? They retaliated against the uh, occupation in the eastern part of the Euphrates in Al Tenth. Mm -hmm. They retaliated against US and British occupying forces on Syrian land in Al Tenth base, which is the most important base for the US in Syria, because it overlooks the entire deep Syrian land as well as uh, it, it's on a very important uh, location where it's very close to the, Syria, to the uh, US bases inside of Jordan where all the training of ISIS uh, mm -hmm. members took place. Also, it's very close by to the Iraqi side 
that has uh, been always uh, been targeted by the American Air Force, which is the Hashd al-Shabi bases on that border, because it's a very, very important land route that attaches Beirut to Damascus, to Baghdad, to Tehran. Mm. That's why uh, uh, the, the, the Americans that specific point, and that's why this specific point was hit, because this was a message to tell them, hello, we're here, you're gonna, you are not going to stay here. This is just the beginning. Mm. Now, what happened uh, two days ago in, uh, in Damascus and in, uh, in the base of, that was attacked with surface-to-surface -surface Israeli missiles inside of Damascus, that was also something new, because it never happened during that part of the day, and it never happened so blatantly. I mean, yes, uh, they, they, they don't have a certain planned or obvious way to attack, but it's a new level of attacks appearing, which explained to us, uh, it, it's, it's like clear for us, Vanessa, to, to know that tension is rising, things are changing fast, and the fact that Turkey itself announced that the U.S. presence in Syria is against the law and is not uh, acceptable, them being occupiers themselves, just brings about facts in the upcoming future that Turkey will be leaving Syria as well, according to the latest round of talks that happened with Russia, and that the demands of the Syrian government will be met because this is Syrian land and this has to stop. Because guess what? It is not only spilling over to Turkey, but Turkey as well is suffering right now from undeclared U.S. sanctions. And I think they, that they will be declared very soon if uh, Turkey uh, pushes back and decides that this should end in Syria. Mm. Another very important thing <clears throat> is uh, the fact that the uh, Kurdish separatists in the northern and northeastern eastern part of Syria have never cut their ties with the government because, as you say, they have multiple times uh, been dropped like a hot potato by the Americans, so they always need a plan B. It's mm. so sad that they that they never just put that plan B, plan A already and decide to come back to the Syrian uh, land and to the Syrian uh, uh, legitimacy and, and sovereignty. But they always have that small dream of theirs, that small ambition to become a separate. You're never going to be a separate state. You are part of Syria. Get over it. Exactly. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's something. Sorry, go on. And I'm just saying it's something that us. it's been more than it's almost 12 years already. I mean, haven't you learned anything? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, you know, you, you mentioned, I mean, there, in, in fact, I wrote about this. I mean, um, since the what I call the data, the reclamation of data by Damascus. And, and this was a very important uh, point in the history of this war, because it was a very clear indication from Damascus that it was maintaining its sovereignty against all the rumors that you know Russia is an imperialist power as it's described in the West uh, was gaining control in Syria that Syria would become a satellite state of Russia but for people to understand that 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 was a decision taken by Damascus uh, very much in a sense against uh, the Russian policy since 2018 to try and control the armed groups uh, left behind in Dada, um, who had carried out a campaign of assassinations, even of their own group members, by the way. I mean, this is gang warfare between these extremist armed groups. They are all uh, mafia groups. They, they fight over money, over status, over territory, uh, over a number of, of things, over drugs also <laughs> sometimes, mostly over revenue. Uh, and Damascus took the decision that no, you know, that they would show a degree of military might to, to bring uh, the, the, the remaining fractured armed groups to the negotiation table, Syrian to Syrian. And this was a very, very important and strategic move made by Damascus because it had a massive domino effect, as you know. Uh, effectively, then we, we had the Assad-Putin summit followed by, as you said, the Erdogan-Putin summit in, in Turkey, where basically Erdogan was slapped down. Egypt told uh, Turkey it would only normalize relations if it withdrew from Syria. Uh, Syria was involved then in uh, trade uh, and economic uh, meetings with Jordan and Egypt regarding the pipeline. The US partially lifts sanctions against Syria 
And we've seen since then a degree of moving towards normalization with President Assad, even in you know, the, the, the colonial media, which is through gritted teeth, basically admitting that, you know, that they, they've lost the intelligence war, which has been waged against Syria since the 1940s onwards, by the way. Uh, again, I just recently collated all of, all of that history together so people can understand how long this has been going on. Um, and to the point where, yes, you know, pressure is on Turkey to, to withdraw from Syria. Right now, it's actually amassing uh, both um, heavy weaponry and forces in Idlib. So one wonders, you know, if Erdogan again is going rogue. If that is the case, then the US uh, coalition is looking to sort of uh back down in some ways of course erdogan then in my view will be in the crosshairs because you know as we know anyone that that interferes in any way with u.s policy is removed yeah. <laughs> in one way yeah, yeah. But, but the the thing is i also follow up uh the turkish uh, internal news mm. as well and uh the turkish uh, population is has grown fed up yeah. from what is going on in Syria. They exactly. went from uh, great friends to the great enemies. Mm. Uh, there is a lot of um, uh, fury within the Turkish public from uh, the refugees, from yeah. the refugees whose areas in Syria have been liberated and uh, they are safe for them to return, but they refuse to return. And the uh, Turkish population is, is getting a bit uh, uncomfortable with the presence of uh, the Syrian uh, refugee issue because their economy is being hit badly, but at the yeah. same time, the UN is paying the Syrian refugees. So that creates, sociologically creates a, a, a rift in one society. Mm. Add to that that the um, the main um, opposition in Turkey, who's now running for uh, for the upcoming uh, for the next elections, and they have a lot of uh, good uh, rates uh, at the moment. They say that at the top of their list is to normalize ties with Syria, remove all. Uh, uh, occupation posts from Syria and uh, completely solve the refugee uh, issue, which has become a refugee crisis for Turkey, to be honest with you. They completely want to uh, regulate, uh, re-regulate uh, things for the refugees so they could go back uh, to their safe uh, cities and villages in Syria. So Erdogan made a huge mistake, but sadly, he's only paying for that mistake 11 years later. Mm. But now things are deteriorating really fast. You should see, you should, you should see how much uh, uh, the Turkish lira has depreciated against the dollar. It's, it's terrible, terrible mm. for the Turkish population. Uh, but I'm, I mean, I'm sorry to say this, but what goes around comes around and it has now come around uh, to Turkey, but sadly, it's hitting the population that had that never had a say in uh, the war on Syria. But it was always the uh, coordination between uh, Erdogan and the um, British and uh, American uh, aggression against Syria. And now, look, he's paying for it. And uh, he, he even he even created some sort of a diplomatic role with the uh, ambassadors of uh, a lot of European. Uh, states like uh, Germany and France and uh, Britain two weeks ago, simply because they were asking about the person that he locked up after the coup attempt in 2016. Mm. So, um, I mean, a lot of things are changing and they're changing really fast. And Turkey really doesn't have an option except to listen to what Russia is bringing to the table, which is basically to apply the demands of the Syrian, legitimate demands of the Syrian government and to withdraw completely and stop arming and funding uh, terrorists uh, inside of Syria. Because trust me, the moment the funding and the retreat happens, it will not end there. You will see a lot of havoc inside of Turkey because the remnants of terrorism will always try to find some place else to get funded by. And they will not find any other place. I'm sorry to say this, but this is what I, my analysis said. They will turn into Turkey and yeah. it, will be, it will be a sad scene. Yeah. And also, I mean, I think, I mean, um, I actually did an interview with um, an, a Turkish opposition MP a few weeks ago, Eli Ashkoy, who's often described as far right. Her position is actually that the war should end 
and that Syrian nationals should be given Syrian citizenship, Syrian education, and should be reintegrated into Syrian society. Personally, that I don't clashes. find that far I'm right. I, I, is that far right? <laughs> exactly. You know, and uh, and she should be really supported in this because she's she's trying to represent the the view of the Turkish people. You know, they have more than five million yeah. Syrian refugees that have been forced yeah. into Turkey Upon by them. a war that yeah. is was not started by Syria against these people. Now, of course, those uh, camps and, and refugee camps are centers of radicalization, of child prostitution, uh, child marriage, child trafficking, child uh, organ trade, et cetera, you know? And so therefore to, to describe anyone as far right who's trying to, to raise awareness of this issue and trying to deal with it, and by dealing with it, trying to bring an end to the Turkish involvement in this destabilization project in Syria, they are not fascist, they're not far right, they, they are realist, um, they may be uh, nationalist, but not you only know, realists, they also want exactly. the best for Syria because exactly. that would be the best for Syria. Mind you, Vanessa, the, the, the mainstream media, the, the Western funded mainstream media goes crazy <laughs> at such statements. Yeah. And by the way, they never talk about what they are doing to the refugees. Look at Sweden, they're preparing to, uh, to, to uh, extradite 2,000 Syrian refugees. Yeah. They want to bring them back to Syria. Is anyone asking them why or why they're doing this? Exactly. Despite the fact that I for sure know that they were never allowed to be extremists in Sweden, but God knows what uh, kind of representative got to the position where he has the power to uh, kick those refugees out. Um, look, I'm not saying that it is right or wrong. I'm saying that there's a process for it. Mm. And when, when we, at the beginning of the war, when we said don't, do an open door policy because you never know who will come through that door when we said that to, to, to Europe and we told them just stop supporting terrorism in Syria, allow the Syrian Arab army to defend itself and eliminate these extremists or else you will have them back in your homeland. Mm -hmm. That's what happened. At that time, they were calling us inhumane and fascists. Yeah, wow. exactly. <laughs> No, no, I mean, that, that's that been an ongoing um, discussion, um, totally, and it's something that we should maybe have a, a completely separate discussion on because it's a huge subject and it's a huge risk for the entire region if, it, if it's not resolved um, in the very near future. And, you know, not only in Turkey, in Lebanon, in Jordan, probably very similar numbers of Syrian refugees. Yes. Um, we have 4 million population Lebanese, yeah. but we have a two, we are now plus 2 million Syrian refugees. Exactly. Mind you, we have 1.6 million Palestinian refugees as well, mm. and, and that's Lebanon. And, and it was never uh, Qatar or Saudi Arabia or the United Arab Emirates who funded the war that actually accepted refugees to protect them. <laughs> exactly. <I> mean, <clears throat> exactly. But I think, I mean, you mentioned the, the recent attack on um, the air defense base to the west of Damascus to, to let people know exactly where it is. Of course, um, I happen to be there because uh, the, the air defense base kind of surrounds an area where you can go and ride and you can walk your dogs and, or, you know, it's, it's a relatively peaceful area. And as you said, this attack was during the day, which was completely unexpected. Um, we're all used to the cowardly Israeli attacks sort of late at night to three in the morning yeah. or, or before. Um, but, but this was totally unexpected. Um, I mean, I was 100 meters away from the first blast. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and for, to, to let people know, I mean, unexpectedly, because it's usually deserted at this time, but there was a meeting of around 100 people, civilians, uh, having an association meeting in the area at that time. And the blast actually uh, hit, or the first missile hit, uh, directly behind where they were meeting. If, if that had hit any closer, there would have been a civilian massacre, massacre. as a result of Israeli aggression. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was told um, that they had targeted, I, I'm not exactly sure in English um, how to describe it, but it was effectively a, a, a sort of something that helped uh, the radar equipment in the air defense base to detect uh, Israeli missiles. And that had recently been activated. So Israel uh, targeted it. So this nonsense 
<laughs> about targeting um, Hezbollah or Iran in this area is is utter nonsense, you know. And again, you you yes. mentioned the fact. I mean, so look, what if are they we, were are there? We... <laughs> Vanessa, we never hide our martyrs. On the exactly. contrary, we are proud of them. We do funeral processions in midday and thousands of people take part. Mm. We don't have any uh, to, any uh, martyrs from that attack. And even though, even th let's say it, it actually was the Hezbollah base, what gives Israel the right to exactly. bomb another sovereign state? Exactly. I mean, Israel has every right to have British and French German and American allies, but we don't have the right to be allies while we are one people. We mm. are the same natives. No, I know. We are not separated. They created lines on maps to separate us, but we are the same people. And now they want to, sorry, I have to use that word. They want to bitch about us being having an alliance mm. for the love of God. I mean, no, and what I mean, kind you know, of. If, if if you work out that that attack took place, I think it was around a quarter past 11. If that had been yeah. one hour before, it's a racetrack there. There would have been dozens of people riding. And it's there would weekend. have been people. It was, it was watching, Saturday. Training. It was a weekend. Yeah. It was a weekend. People, people go to yes. those open areas, especially at these times before winter yeah. starts to have the last uh, yeah, picnic, to have or a picnic or outing or whatever it is. Yes, exactly. I mean, I mean, what kind of cycles do that? Exactly. You know, and, and it's and it's the it's the same excuse saying, well, you know, you have civilians around. Um, an air defense base. I mean, Syria is a country at war. You know, of course, there are civilians that are always going to be at risk from these attacks. It's impossible for them not to be. It's the same argument that's used in Gaza. Uh, and both, you know, Eva and myself have been in Gaza under the Israeli aggression. It's impossible for the armed resistance to, to put their rocket launchers away from civilian um, targets. Because you know you have what a population of around two million in an area of land forty kilometers by twelve kilometers. It's impossible. So all of these excuses by uh, the the Zionist entity to to justify their murderous, unlawful, genocidal aggression against either Palestine, Lebanon, uh, any of the regional resistance allies is is utterly it's just depraved and um i mean i don't know what kind of a debate these people get on but i mean when they say oh look at missiles coming out of gaza oh what do you want you want exactly. gaza to sit down and shut up while you bomb the hell out of them while you carpet bomb them the biggest open air prison in the world the biggest besieged blockaded area and people in the world you want them to die and then die smiling and saying thank you for the nice hundred thousand dollar missile that fell on our heads i mean it's ridiculous it's really yeah, ridiculous I, I, and it's the same with you know that some of the arguments from the so-called um palestinian movements in the west that sort of say oh but we'd much prefer if you peacefully march on the streets you know, who's going to care if Gazans go out well, on the streets and I'd love to food. hear their same statement. Let's bring those people who organize such marts and put, put them just for two days in Gaza and see mm -hmm. how their statements will change. It's exactly. so nice to say these colorful, rosy words when you are hundreds of thousands of kilometers away. Very mm -hmm. nice. No, it's it's a... You know, and I, but I think what, what's in, the important point here, first of all, it was the first time that Israel in this last uh, 10 years, to my knowledge, has attacked so sort of blatantly in the daytime surface to surface uh, missiles. And they were using winged missiles because when I first, I was walking and I could hear this noise and I was thinking, that's strange. They don't normally have, um, you know, um, uh, the jets in the sky at this time of day and I was thinking Syrian jets <laughs> right yeah. because it's not normal for Israel to attack at this time uh, and then suddenly the first explosion hit and that was followed by uh, a number of others at least four or five or some were intercepted but it took everyone by surprise uh, and um these winged missiles are, are incredibly destructive. As I said, if they had hit any of the civilian installations that are very close to that air defense base, it would have been a, an absolute massacre. But the other thing is that um, the, the equipment they targeted, uh, someone, a couple of people pointed out on, on Twitter that this is potential for you know, wiping out the ability of 
um, the Syrian army to detect missiles or to detect an attack. Uh, and that might mean that there's a bigger attack uh, planned, which is in line with what we were saying, that there's potential for a real escalation of this conflict with the no, um, against Al Tanaf, with now Israel bombing in the daytime, uh, which has never happened. Um, no, Vanessa, so what, what, what really just plays games in my mind is the fact, first of all, I'm really grateful and thankful that you were safe and you were right <laughs> and you were uh, not uh, injured in any way or form. Second thing is we talk about this, that if this missile had hit that or if that missile, you know, yesterday we had the first rainstorm in Lebanon for mm. the winter uh, season and uh, there was um, a, what do you call it, thunderstorm. Mm. And my kids were genuinely afraid. Yeah, It was the first time I see fear in their eyes because of a thunderstorm. Mm. Because they went through hell this summer when we had bombings around our house by the Israeli entity, but it shattered my heart yesterday that my eldest daughter came to my room and said, mom, what is that sound? I mean, the fact that we talk about them targeting areas, whether they're military bases or not, but the, the actual PTSD that happens to our generation and the generation before that and to our children because of the sounds and the fear and the insecurity and the mm. level of terrified. Uh, I mean, I mean, it's, it's like, you should see them how they sit down and just grab themselves. You know, they mm. just grab their hands and they started listening. And I had to play a colorful image in their heads by telling them how thunderstorms are very important to create <laughs> springs in the soil mm. and that how that will help us because we were in, in, in Khiam in, the, in, in mm. South Lebanon yesterday and we had this beautiful garden and how this, if rain doesn't come down, we wouldn't have this beautiful garden. And I tried to get them out of the situation, but how much can I really do? Yeah. And it's the same thing in Syria. I mean, when, when that happens, yes, Syria is at war, but if this had happened to any, any name, just any other country, you would have seen major hysteria, paranoia, <laughs> I mean, in the media, in the global media, and this is an entire war from each and every side. It's mm -hmm. a medical war, a media war, a, a military war, a civil, civ actually a civilization war. It's a social, a socialist war. It's everything. It's all kinds of wars. This is the first kind of war with all that phases that happens against any country in the world that mm -hmm. Syria went through. Yeah, and let's, the let's only, not... maybe the only country that has passed through that is actually uh, uh, Palestine and Gaza mm -hmm. in specific. But we, we, when we talk about this, sometimes I just, I, my mind just uh, wanders off thinking, why should we accept the noise, not only the danger? We should mm -hmm. not even accept noise that is, that, that, that is illegal in our, in our country or in our borders. I mean, look, Israel is looking for a, a war. Yeah. No one likes wars, whether us or the other side. No one wants a war. But they are craving for an open mm. aggression against Lebanon, Syria, and other factions of the resistance in the area, namely Iraq. And they expect us to just sit there and not retaliate. I mean, I mean, this is not even logical. It's not mm. logical. I mean, I know, I know myself, <laughs> if the resistance in Lebanon would want to retaliate against any sort of aggression, they would, before they retaliate, they would know that there were, might be, and there most probably will be, an attack by Israel uh, that follows that retaliation. We know that it's a give and take operation, but for us to, to have gotten to a point where we actually made it a give and take instead of us sitting there, like sitting ducks and waiting for bombs to fall, of us, fall over our heads, it's been more than 35 years of that continuous work of resistance. And it's been more than uh, at, at almost 12 years for, um, for Syria. It's, it's, yeah. it's an entire generation that grew in fear and anxiety mm -hmm. and insecurity. And at the same time, you have nonstop ways of aggression, whether mm -hmm. through economic sanctions or, or further occupation or further funding of terrorism and uh, fundamentalism in, in Syria. And it seems that despite the fact that they are losing it at every level, they always have the drive to continue. I just wonder what their breaking point will be. I want to know. 
I think, I mean, I think only, it, sadly, and this is what a lot of people don't understand in the West, you can only meet this kind of disproportionate aggression and, and really uh, psychopathic uh, genocidal reflex from, from these entities um, with aggression. It's, it's, it's impossible to do it any other way because that's the only uh, language they understand. You know, two weeks ago, we had the, the terrorist uh, bomb attack uh, at one of the busiest areas in Damascus. It's, it's literally the center of Damascus. One hour later, it would have been full of students and people going to work and catching the service and the, the shared taxis um, to work to universities and so on at the president's bridge. Uh, where the terrorists uh, put IEDs on the on the bottom of a bus and killed uh, 14 people that everyone claimed, first of all, were military. They weren't military. Uh, the majority were civilians that were working in military uh, institutions, but were civilians. You know, and as a friend of mine here said, she said, you know, we started to, to recover uh, from the, the terrorist war now we realize that they are still among us, the, the terrorist sleeping cells, and that they can be activated or triggered at any time. So of course, you know, what they want to do, like the, the Israeli uh, Air Force flying fast through the air above Gaza to create the sonic boom explosions, which freak the children out that have already lived um, through, through various uh, wars and weeks of uh, genocidal aggression. Um, so, you know, it's, it's all about the terrorization of human beings, of civilians, civilians that are completely innocent in, in their projects, and they, they don't care about them. This is the bottom line. They don't care about the children that can't sleep or the adults that are terrified all the time for their children or jump out of their skin every time uh, a car backfires or, you know, this is, this is life here. And then add to that, as you said, in Lebanon, uh, here in all the countries that resist imperialism, add the, the savagery and sadism of economic sanctions that ensure not only are these people living in a constant state of PTSD and terror, they are starving <laughs> and they're unable to make a living. They don't have a future. They, they are mentally oppressed. They are physically oppressed. They are emo emotionally oppressed. And they are kept in that state of, of, of fear and, and um, lack of, of optimism and lack of future by these entities, because they know that way they can keep them uh, uh, under control and they can steal what they want. They can steal the wheat and barley and the oil and the water and whatever they want from these countries, pick them dry. But as you said, they've underestimated the power of the resistance and the strength of the ideology that refuses to, to kneel down to this kind of subjugation, which is, you know, that's what it is. This, this is the modern day missionary uh, imperialism, right? Um, and, and it's going to end. And, and in my view, and I don't know if you agree with me, but almost uh, the only way it can end is, is by an escalation in the conflict and by them really getting hurt. We saw that when Gaza responded recently. And we saw the number of Israelis that were fleeing uh, the Zionist state because suddenly they realized that they were not as invulnerable as they thought they were when even Gaza matchsticks, <laughs> you know, really in comparison to, to the armory that Hezbollah or Iran or Syria have, um, was doing enormous damage. It was do the biggest damage it did was to Israel's image. Um, and they know that. And that's why now I think Naftali Bennett, particularly who's even more far right, even more warmongering than Netanyahu, is, as you said, pushing. He wants the conflict. He wants to regain their, 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 their power, their status as the super force, which of course they're not. Sorry, that was a rant. Well, no, no, I'm actually, look, the issue is that I completely 
uh, agree with you, but it's it's a bit, uh, as you mentioned, it's a bit complicated for the mm. uh, audience who are not part of the region to fully yeah. understand it, because sometimes certain uh, acts of aggression that comes from uh, a colonizing body that like the Zionist entity is uh, sometimes is strictly based on internal political matters mm. that uh, someone needs to flex their muscles in front of their yeah. uh, electoral uh, uh, audience or their that the people I mean during a campaign or something just to get their trust uh, they flex their muscles but other times is when uh, when look I completely understand that uh, Israel is terrified of the fact that a new uh, power a new force uh, a new uh, opposing force to the actual existence of the Zionist entity has emerged and is becoming even more powerful and it's now even more powerful by the day not by the year mm. and it's it, it has completely surrounded it the only um, if you will safety net that it has left is the uh, alliance that it's forging with the uh, uh, with, with the royal families, which do not represent the, 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 the public in uh, the Arab Peninsula. Mm. This is the final security net for, uh, for Israel's uh, illegal existence. I mean, even the US itself, the new Biden administration took a step back from the promises that Trump gave uh, the Zionist entity, which put Israel at a very hesitative, uh, at a very hesitant uh, phase throughout the months. Uh, and. Uh, up until we saw Naftali Bennett visiting uh, uh, President um, Vladimir Putin, mm. uh, I think it was 10 days ago when he visited Russia, there's a big question as to what were the actual Israeli demands uh, from uh, the Russian Federation that they sent their prime minister to meet with the president and what they actually want, because it's obviously about uh, Syria and Lebanon. It's more about Syria than it is uh, about Lebanon, to be honest with you. Mm. And it it goes to show the, the level of attacks, the level of development in the attacks that occurred on Syria in the, in the past month alone are the a big indication that not it's, it's a big indication, not that Israel is preparing for something bigger. It's also a bigger indication that the allied forces of resistance in the region have come up with a new strategy mm. to defend themselves. And that is a very scary issue, a very scary mm. fact for both the Israelis and the Americans, which prompted them to coordinate the latest attack on Palmyra. Mm. There's no other uh, indication other than this. It means that the full liberation of Syria, in my opinion, will not take another year. I think mm. it's it's a matter of months. I don't think that 2022 will end when we still have, for example, Turkish occupation or even probably American occupation is in, in Syria. Khalas, this phase is over. And this is what scares the heck out of Israel. Mm. The fact that the chaos, it paid so much money, it invested in for the past decade, went down the drain. Nothing of it actually was met. Nothing of it uh, was uh, proved to be a more secure uh, region for Israel. On the contrary, it just ignited the entire region against uh, Israel to a point when you have Yemenis saying that we are ready to bomb Tel Aviv all the way here from Yemen. You mm -hmm. have uh, Iraqi resistance factions that say we will take part in the liberation of Palestine. This is something that we would have never heard before 10 years ago, Vanessa. Yeah. It's a decade that was very important for everyone, <laughs> but specifically important for the natives of the Levant, for the natives of West Asia, because it brought them back together after 100 mm. years of division by Sykes-Picot. Yeah, absolutely. So, demographics are changing, the borders are changing, even the most aggressive regimes in the region are shifting, like Jordan was very aggressive to, towards mm. the Syrian government, it shifted, and Turkey as well is shifting, and it might actually cost Erdogan his position for Turkey to yeah. completely shift, but it's to a point for the Turks that they don't really care anymore, they just, they just want to, they, they, they want this phase to be over, they are tired, they are... Uh, so so do the Jordanians, by the way. They are also mm. tired of uh, this, the, this major shift and this major earthquake 
that hit our region, it, it has been shaking up for five, 10 years, but we came out of it uh, healthier. We came out of it with better friends, with bigger group of friends that share the same uh, uh, objectives for the region and the same uh, um, maybe vision uh, for our peoples in, in, in this region. And, and I, I completely believe, I have faith it's not only analysis. I have faith inside of me that says that the upcoming 10 years will be great for Syria and even greater for uh, the uh, axis of resistance, have they, how they call it. I like to call it the allied forces of resistance uh, in West Asia. And, and I think major shifts are to happen in the entire region and mainly, my friend, in the Arabian Peninsula. Mm. Well, I would. I, I think we should leave it on that really um, positive conclusion. Um, and uh, I, I agree with you um, definitely. And and I really um, pray for Syria, for Lebanon, for Palestine, for the entire region that that you know this this comes true. And I think uh, we will look back in history and look at the leadership of the resistance and see uh, retrospectively the wisdom of um, that leadership, the command that have come together and brought their, their groups together. And as you said, you know, this is the unification of all the different um, sects and um, it's defeated the, the, the sectarian division project that was being uh, instigated for, for decades. Uh, by the US and, and the Zionist entity and the UK. So thank you, Marwa, for ending on that really um, positive, uplifting note. Um, and I hope we can all celebrate together in Damascus in the very, very near future. Thank you very much. I hope so too. And I thank you very much, Vanessa, for uh, bringing this uh, out to the public to hear and, uh, and uh, learn uh, about and educate themselves about because it's very important because so it's something that we never read or hear or watch in uh, the Western funded mainstream media or the uh, regional Wahhabi funded media. So thank you for that and appreciate your voice and your uh, stance with uh, Syria and the friends of Syria. And I'm very thankful that you were okay and you were not harmed in the biggest attack. Thank you. And I'll speak to you again uh, very soon. Inshallah.